So, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Mustafa Abdulkader, and I am a software engineer at Invisia. Um, I do want to give a little bit of a sales pitch on myself and uh, the company I work for. So, I've been a uh, software engineer professionally for about four or five years, but I've always been really four or five is maybe a stretch, maybe three or four, sort of lost track of time. <laughs> um, the computers and programming has always been a big part of my life. Um, I love exploring new things and new technologies and seeing everything there is out there um, to explore and understand. Um, I think the open source community and technology is uh, fascinating and uh, it's cool how even though you know, we're all at home currently, we're still able to produce great things and uh, collaborate and uh, really drive innovation. Um, and I think Invisia is a great company to help foster that attitude and mentality. Um, we're a software consulting firm based out of Chicago. Uh, we have offices in Milwaukee and Madison as well. Um, and uh, I think we are hiring. So if you guys are interested or looking, feel free to reach out to me um, and I can get you in touch with the appropriate channels. Um, with that being said, uh, let's get started. So as you guys may have read from the description, uh, we will be covering big data and web sockets. Um, a lot of people, I think, have this assumption, especially the general population, that big data is pretty much spyware and will track your every movement and <laughs> sort of encapsulate all the information there is out there. Um, and maybe some companies are trying to do that, uh, but big data is more of a representation of leveraging analytics and information to help drive business decisions and uh, get useful, meaningful analytics out of that data. Um, and big data doesn't necessarily have to be enterprise level. Um, it could be anything from your IoT device publishing temperature data or, um, you know, video camera feeds and analyzing those or really anything um, is possible. Uh, big data just sort of represents the conglomeracy of all things data and how you use it effectively. Um, WebSockets are a web technology that allow full communication between a server and client without having to constantly pull for more data, um, which is nice because having a socket open opens up the possibility of really, um, you know, just, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought here, but really opens the possibility of what you can do on the front end and how you can integrate your systems on the back end and all the information processing that's going on there and hooking it into your front end. And in our example, that'll be using React. So you might be wondering what a few use cases are of this technology. Um, I don't know how many of you have worked in corporations that do leverage uh, information processing at a very fast rate, um, but there are a multitude of examples um, from logistics and processing shipment info um, and any new events that come from that shipment to uh, financial firms that need to regulate and maybe flag transactions or process transactions in an effective manner, um, how they design their pipelines and really manipulate that data to really extract all the information out of there. Um, in our use case, we'll be uh, using a very popular topic, which is COVID. Um, there's really no implementation in place 
Um, and this might be because we've never had to deal with something on this scale before, but there's no implementation in place for uh, real-time analytics of COVID data. Um, John Hopkins does release uh, daily reports on their GitHub of any new information they get, but all that data is sort of aggregated together via different <laughs> sources. Uh, faxes, I'm guessing, is a big part of it. Emails, maybe. I'm not really sure how that information gets collected, but we do have a bit of a delay on that information being readily available to everybody. And uh, this poses a problem because um, with the information being delayed, we can't really be as reactive to it as if we had that information more readily available. Um, sorry, I don't know if you guys can hear my cat meowing. Um, and yeah, so let's dive into some of the different ways of how we can sort of pull this data um, or rather retrieve the data. We have three different mechanisms that currently exist and I think are the most popular. I'm sure there are others that I may not know about, but uh, we'll be sort of understanding what polling is, uh, how WebSockets work, and server-side events. So polling is the act of, um, as a client, continuously grabbing a resource. And this is generally okay if your data doesn't update all too often. Let's say you have alerts on a web page that you want to display to the user. Um, they don't need to necessarily have that data instantly available. Um, so maybe polling every five minutes is a good solution for that. Um, but as you can see here, uh, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse cursor, but um, the HTTP request lifecycle sort of, and this is encrypted, so HTTP, oh, I mentioned that. <laughs> um, the request lifecycle sort of has a few steps that happen transparently to the end user. Oops, sorry. Um, first, they have to send the synchronize uh, message and then they acknowledge that. Uh, this is client and server. And then after that, they um, set up the key exchange and get their information sort of all ready to go to send the request. This is very exhaustive. You can see the timelines here. This will take 200 milliseconds. Um, that doesn't sound like a lot, but when we're having messages being sent to us at a very fast and continuous rate, making these requests every 200 milliseconds will definitely take up some time. Um, and we'd like to have the most performant technology available to us. Um, to be able to handle this information exchange. So we can avoid doing all these steps by switching over to WebSockets. Now this is gonna have the same initial handshake uh, as described here, but afterwards we just have a full persistent connection between the client and the server. Now this is full duplex, meaning um, the server can send messages to the client and the client can also send messages back to the server. Um, you might be wondering why we might need uh, WebSockets for this sort of retrieval of real-time data if we only want the server to send us data. Um, and that's where we get into server-side events where instead of being full duplex, sorry, <laughs> scroll wheel, um, Instead of being full duplex, we just have communication from the server to the client. Um, but that has its own limitations in the amount of connections you can have open. Um, I believe all major web browsers do support server-side events, um, but they didn't get as much popularity and traction as WebSockets, which seems to have a bigger foundation of library support and um, sort of articles, blog posts about to help better understand it. Um, so I do believe that server-side events are not here to stay. Um, 
But if you need something a bit lighter weight, maybe that is the approach you need to take. Uh, but for our example, we'll be using WebSockets, even if we won't use the full communication bandwidth availability to us, we'll, uh, we'll have this sort of foundation in place to make this very easy and seamless. Um, and you can note that the client or the server can both close a connection, or obviously if the connection gets severed by external means, such as a network outage, um, that connection will close on its own. So we can keep the connection alive till we're done with it, and that'll be sort of like a page transfer or redirect or something else like that. Let's go to the next slide. Now, how does this all come into play? Um, we need to implement some sort of message bus for our WebSocket to be able to bind to. Um, most enterprise applications that do uh, message processing will probably have a message bus in place just because it sort of eases the facilitation of adding new uh, consumers or new publishers to the message bus. Um, sort of like the internal workings of electric grid or something in that you don't really think about it, but it does power a lot of the infrastructure or maintains a whole bunch of the infrastructure that we need to live our lives normally. Um, and there are a few different message buses available. Um, in our example, we'll be using Kafka and it might be a bit overkill um, for a single consumer, single publisher, but the benefit of it is that it can represent a real-time uh, event message bus that you'd normally see in sort of a corporate environment. Um, a lot of people do have experience with it, and if you don't, um, it simply works as this pipe. You have an application, it can push messages onto it, and any other application that's available can either listen to that topic or it can choose to just pass it along. And uh, you can end up chaining these sort of uh, consumers to also be publishers and create a pipeline of transformations or um, analytics, like putting data into a database, um, then normalizing that data, um, having another consumer send that data off to another third party integration that you have connected. Um, and in our use case, we'll have a consumer that publishes the messages received to any open WebSocket connection. Now, there's um, a nice library um, called RxJS. And uh, I think the Rx series sort of spans a multitude of different languages. The framework, I think, has bindings to uh, .NET, Java, um, and you might be familiar with this, and you might not be, but it is a really nice way to handle, um, well, let me read the description. Uh, <laughs> this is from their website. Um, RxJS is a library for composing asynchronous and event-based programs by using observable sequences. Now that's a lot of buzzwords, but effectively what it is, is a extension to your sort of stream. And uh, you can imagine this line here being a pipe and any messages that come to it are these little circles. Um, and you can apply different transformations or mutations or um, utility functions to this pipeline to transform that data. So for example, uh, this is a map operator and all this is doing is multiplying the result of any event that comes in. In this case, they're numbers by 10. So you get 10, 20, 30. Um, and this is a very strong library to use when you're integrating with um, real-time data, just because it handles um, events as a sort of primitive to um, your code base. Uh, and the, they label it reactive 
driven development or uh, I think that's what it is. Um, but yeah, so you can react to the changes of data or inputs to the data uh, very rapidly and uh, it is all lazily loaded. So um, this right here signifies a completion. So in our case, this would be a closing of that WebSocket. Um, but this operation doesn't happen immediately just as the messages get subscribed to. So if we're using it somewhere else, for example. And uh, with that being said, it's time to show you guys the demo. Uh, so we won't start here yet. Now let me know if you all can see this font fine. I'm hoping you can. Hello, how are you guys? Take that as we are good to go. Um, so to kick things off, I uh, did a similar uh, presentation for JCon 20, so that's why the name's there. Um, but uh, for this, I'll be sort of focusing more on the um, front end and the React side of things. But I'd like to just sort of give a general overview um, to what it takes to bring up a system like this. Um, so we have three scripts here, four, but we'll just go over this one. So we have startup.sh, and all this is responsible for is starting Postgres, um, starting up our Kafka, and creating a topic. Now I already have everything up, so I won't need to run that. Um, we have uh, produce.sh. Now, what this one does is it calls my COVID data gen. Uh, just to give a little uh, background on to what the application is, um, we have a program called COVID data gen that is responsible for generating realistic COVID data. Um, and that is uh, using Faker.js to generate names, date of births, and stuff like this. Uh, we'll look into to that in a little bit. Um, and we have a Java app that exposes um, a WebSocket connection um, to be able to connect to, um, but also listens as a consumer to this cases events topic and uh, publishes any of those messages to uh, whoever is connected. Um, so all this is doing is it's running that COVID data gen program for the amount that we want, dash G being generate. Um, I could resize that. So generate the number of case events. Um, it's slurping all that into an array using JQ. And then it's iterating through each one of those, um, assigning an ID as the key and piping that to Kafka Cat to publish the message. Um, and with that being said, we can go and have a look at uh, COVID data gen. Um, let's go and open the index. Uh, to break this down, we just have a few things. Uh, bring in a few imports. We use uh, NeedDB for our data store, and this is to handle um, sort of updating already existing data, like a person goes and gets tested. Uh, we need another event to handle um, whether or not they're positive or negative and what the outcome was, whether they recovered or died. Um, so this just manages that store for us. But the big block of code that is important creates a logger, um, sets up some constants, is this chunk right here. Um, this is sort of the, the fruit of the application. Um, to break it up a little bit, uh, we have the amount of case events they want to generate, and we'll either decide between a new event or an update event. And if it's a new event, we'll handle a new event. Otherwise, we'll handle an update event right there. Um, and then we'll log it appropriately. So we can see an example of this. If we generate, for example, two. Here is, so what happened here is that it tried generating an update event, um, but there was no uh, new event to update. So it skipped that one, but we have this right here, 
we can take that to uh, JQ. It's going to be a new event, but just to show it a little bit easier. Um, we have an ID, we have a test date, we have date of birth, the name, the location, um, the age, and the status. So if we keep repeating this, we can see that Josh Kling was confirmed and it's an uh, update event. So this is what's gonna sort of process our uh, real-time data or simulate our real-time data, just because there's no avenue to get real-time data currently. Um, and that wraps up COVID data gen. We're gonna just have a brief look into the Java application that sort of drives this. Um, we have a few classes here. Um, so let's just go into the controller. Um, this is gonna just get two endpoints or expose two endpoints, one for the stats. And we can see this over here. The confirmed recovered deaths um, and negative cases. That's gonna be the initial page load. Um, uh oh. That again. Um, and then we have the recents, and that's going to be that bottom portion that shows the recent cases. Um, what else do we have? Um, we have a repository. This just connects to our Postgres uh, database, and we just have some model classes, just POCOs, POCOs that represent the status count and the type, you know, meaningless. Um, and this is, I think the more important aspect is our case consumer implementation. Um, I know this is a React conference, but uh, bear with me just a little bit here because it's important to understand how this all ties together. Um, all this is doing is it's listening on this topic and it's handling the event with case event service and case event service is just, uh, checking if that exists, adding it to our database, and then it's sending the message to our WebSocket. And that's all it does. Um, all this code is on GitHub, so I won't dive into it uh, too deeply. Um, and then this is the part that I think we've all been waiting for. Um, this is the dashboard and this is written in React um, with the Yarn build system. Um, and we can see that we have just a few components, uh, but the one where everything sort of happens is the main dashboard. Now, um, I know React has sort of taken a big step towards using hooks instead of the class declaration for component initialization. Um, Truthfully, I'm not a big fan of hooks. Um, I think the component lifecycle made more sense using classes, um, but for the sake of not being grilled, I decided to change these two functional components. Um, and we'll break this down step by step, but primarily we have a hook for use state um, that sets up our COVID stats. Um, this is potential, confirmed, negative, recovered, and dead. And this is the state that we'll update to uh, on any new message that we get. We have this handle data, which we'll explore in a little bit. Um, and we have two effects here. Um, this just gets set up on initialization. Um, one calls and sets stats. The other one calls the recent cases and sets those. Um, we do a little transformation here just because the date does come back as an array uh, when Java serializes it. Um, and I'll explain why I chose that design decision in a little bit. And then our last effect is our um, most important, which is where RxJS comes into play. Um, so we'll look in that in a bit, but the rest of it is just uh, JSX for setting up the component. So if we look for WS observable, um, 
let me get rid of these real quick. But the cool thing is um, RxJS does expose um, a module for WebSockets, and this takes care of all the grunt work of connecting and maintaining the connection. Um, and when we create it, it does create a subject. Um, and the subject sort of is just a, a source of events or messages, rather. And the cool thing about RxJS is that we can pipe each message um, and transform that data accordingly. So we just have two simple transformations here, but um, I'm sure you can imagine uh, the possibilities are endless as to what you can do with it. For example, we have the map operator. And um, all this does is transforms these two properties into dates. Because like I said before, uh, they came in as an array of year, month, and day. Um, and that just goes to show that it's very adaptable to uh, your, preparations and your use case a bit better, um, whatever that may be, even if the data might not be represented the way you want to, you can um, append it or modify it or mutate it however you'd like. The second one is called tap. Now, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Unix tool called T, but this one sort of uh, hooks into the pipe of uh, transformations and uh, takes the message but doesn't really act on it. Um, all it does is it grabs the message and forwards it off uh, like it, did it was never there. Um, and all I'm doing here is just demonstrating that uh, we can use this but also use it for logging purposes. So we're just taking that data and logging it. And if we go back, um, when we're ready to handle those messages coming in, uh, we take that observable and we just subscribe to it. And this is what's gonna take the lazy, initializ lazy initialization and effectively initialize it. Um, and that's where handle data comes into play. And uh, that is a callback. And we're gonna explore that right now. Um, we have status, this just grabs status out of the data that we have, and we have the case data. And I'll show why I split that up in a bit. Um, so if status is present, let's set stats. Um, if they're dead or recovered, then the confirmed count goes down. If they're negative or confirmed, uh, their potential status goes down. Uh, not the case itself or the person of the case, but the stats we use to manage. Um, and then the general, otherwise, whatever else is remaining, I think this would be a potential, would go up by one. And then we just return the stats uh, to that object. Now, if it's case data, um, here's a transformation we're applying. We're concatenating uh, using um, Lodash, and we're adding the case data to the first, but we're also removing any element in that array that um, has that same ID. Because if we get a message that uh, was previously potential but now is confirmed, we don't want to show that in our recent cases twice. We want to remove it and add this new one. Um, and that manages that for us. So that is cool. And um, yeah, I guess that is it. And I can run this to show you guys sort of how it all comes into play. Um, yarn start. Ignore these warnings. And these, <laughs> you know, uh, this is also published on GitHub. So if you guys want to uh, explore it or even fix my code, um, I'd be more than happy to uh, accept your pull request. Um, I am not the best React developer, um, but I do like playing around with it. So 
I'm open to any suggestions in case I've done something wrong or maybe there's a better way of doing something. And this is just going to start our Gradle instance or Java instance um, using Gradle. And uh, COVID data gen, we don't even have to run. It just sort of lives as a binary. Um, so we can move on from there. Looks like everything is working. Um, and if we go back to the UI and refresh this page, hopefully this is working and we didn't, I might have cleared the database prior, but uh, let's just go over that one real quick. It's just uh, passes that clear flag to our COVID data gen to clear the data store and also uh, clears out any events from uh, the database. So yeah, it deleted zero. So I think it was just empty. And now we can do produce SH and we'll pass in 10 events. So here's the events coming through. Now, <laughs> uh, it went a bit too fast for us to really see it happening in real time, but um, we can see that the potential amount of cases is five, the confirmed is one. Uh, there's no negative or recovered yet. And unfortunately one person died. Um, and we can see all the recent cases here. Um, it looks like we do have a bug in our date, so <laughs> ignore that. That's okay. What we're going to do now is just crank that number up to 100 so we can see it sort of all coming in real time. And we can see that we definitely have an opportunity here to um, really push the boundaries of what is available to us. Um, we no longer have to wait for messages to come in or press refresh button on the grid to pull for new data. Um, for someone who is monitoring um, COVID events and uh, latest updates, a tool like this could be helpful in sort of demonstrating how, or not demonstrating, but rather getting something meaningful out of it, um, identifying hotspots sooner, um, closing down states that seem to be on the uptick. Um, so it can really have a lot of uh, potential there. I do know that Georgia Tech, and this sort of validated my <laughs> theory quite a bit, um, which was sort of nice, uh, but Georgia Tech students, I believe, uh, created a real-time dashboard for um, COVID hotspots, uh, which sort of let you place your mouse over a certain area and check the severity of that location. Um, after doing a bit more further research on it, it did seem like it was still a day old information, but if they had the resources available to handle real-time data, um, or if the real-time data was even just generally available to them, they would have had better luck in really getting this caught early on and being able to quarantine zones appropriately. Um, and just to sort of demonstrate, um, we can refresh this page and uh, see that these numbers are all the same. So we don't really run into any state issues. Um, because the same messages that are being inserted into the database we're handling on the UI as well. Um, we can sort of guarantee that what we see here is an accurate representation of um, that information. Um, and just to sort of, hopefully this works, but show a more realistic example is we could just have a thousand events coming in at a time um, maybe we even want to set a delay because this information is unreadable at a certain point because um, it's coming in too fast. We could buffer it and add some lag um, to give a better user experience um, and give an opportunity for the analyst to really understand what's going on. Um, but yeah, it's fun to just sort of see it add and remove and mutate itself without really having to pull. Um, as you can imagine, getting this data uh, via requests um, or HTTP GET requests would be certainly a strain. And uh, I would imagine it would even slow down your browser if you're trying to access that data at the speed that this is just coming in. 
and um, sorry, my cat's in the way. Um, yeah, so I guess that uh, wraps up my presentation. Um, I do want to note that, um, lastly, if that's okay, um, this has implications beyond just COVID. I mean, I, I think that if something was available to us from the start, we could have saved countless amount of lives and I don't want to get political here, but um, there's really opportunity for real-time data to be used for not only, you know, business gain, but also just general life-saving technology that really could, I think, uh, change the world we live in and really give us, I know that information sort of spreads at this very rapid rate already and a lot of us are consumed by it, but um, if we take it away from trying to drive social media analytics and apply it to something uh, more, I think, noble, we could uh, foster a better world and uh, really showcase that technology isn't evil and it's here to help us and not, you know, take us down. <laughs> So with that being said, uh, I'll end my speech there and uh, stop sharing. And um, yeah, so I, I guess I'm open to any questions if any of you guys have any. Um, I know I was a little short on the time there, so I apologize, but um, I could dig deeper into the code or talk about anything you guys would want me to. Oh, yeah. Awesome, Safa. Thanks a lot. Yeah, let's see if we got any questions. And uh, if anyone wants to stick around and dive any deeper. <laughs> Brian uh, Norquest says, says uh, have cat? Question <laughs> mark. I have. Yeah, and they're uh, in a tiny apartment. They're sort of everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> so they were getting all up in my business trying to, you know. Yeah on the keyboard or move my mouse or anything. Uh, James Barkley has a question. Yeah, go ahead. Can we... Uh, Permission. Are, are you muted, James? Hey. Yeah. Oh, hey. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Now we can. Great. So th this is kind of, I, I don't want to get too far over my skis here. Um, I may not know what I'm talking about. Um, but the I was curious about the first um, thing you were showing with WebSockets for polling. In a project that I've been working on, we've got a bunch of GraphQL middleware stuff, and we're using Apollo. And uh, we're just starting to experiment with uh, having Apollo do some of that kind of polling for backend, um, you know, value changes um, to communicate to the front end. I don't know if you've looked at that or if you compared that with RxJS. Uh, like no, I said, it may be this little left field question, but. No, as far as I know, Apollo is a NPM library or JavaScript library for GraphQL communication, right? Yeah. Um, I, I guess I, it doesn't really solve the problem of constantly having to poll. Um, you're still limited by the three technologies available to you. Um, I mean, you can send uh, GraphQL effectively is just aggregation of data into a certain response. Um, I think they still use HTTP as their transport mechanism. Um, I'm not too familiar, so um, if anyone wants to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I think you'd still be limited by constantly having the poll. I don't think Apollo will help you solve that problem. Um, and if it's data that's infrequently changing, then it might be fine um, to use it to update your state and your front end application. But um, I think that if you may find that you're polling way too frequently, then you're just hurting uh, the performance bandwidth of, uh, you know, the network infrastructure uh, between the client and the server um, and putting unnecessary load on the server. Yeah, so GraphQL has subscriptions, um, which maintain an active connection to your GraphQL server, most commonly via WebSocket. Oh, so really? 
Okay. Yeah, so it sounds like it also connect via WebSockets to manage the real-time communication. Yeah. I'm glad I was on point with that answer. <laughs> yeah. I haven't messed around with yeah, I mean, it. Uh, it's something that one of our other devs implemented, so I'm not that familiar with it. So like I said, it could be I just don't know what I'm talking about. But um, anyway, no, that was interesting. Thank you. Absolutely. Good question. I have a question. Um, I could I see how this would allow for really quick communication um, between the server and the client. I'm wondering, would you see any potential bottlenecks for the entire, say, nation trying to update the database that this would be polling from? Would there be any problems from that? And because it seems like your generate events can very quickly create these events, put them in the database, you know, for a thousand or so events. But if the entire, like say a nation was trying to, you know, create these uh, one grand set of data, would there be any bottlenecks that would have to be kind of dealt with on that end? I would imagine there would be. Um, and you're right, a thousand events is very low scale, low volume. Um, the nice thing about big data um, is that it's not really tied to a certain technology. Um, we have measures in place uh, that we can leverage or technology in place that we can leverage to handle um, a large volume of data. And the nice thing is Kafka sort of works um, as a receiver as well. So we can throw in, excuse me one second. If anyone wants to see, this is the cat that's been bothering me all day. <laughs> throw her on the ground. <laughs> um, sorry, lost my train of thought, but um, we can use Kafka sort of as a way to handle that volume of data and scale the consumers to um, really process that information as needed. So um, for example, let's say we have every state has a connection or access to publish data to a central system. Um, and maybe we need 10 consumers to handle all that data coming in. We have a hook, web hook, that publishes the message to a Kafka topic. Um, I'm just sort of visualizing this example. Um, we might not necessarily use Postgres, because I don't think we need the consistency guarantees there. Um, something that can sort of be more uh, accessible and uh, readily available. Um, not readily available, but, you know, just more performant in just mass inserts. Um, we could break some ACID guarantees to sort of handle that influx of data and maybe process them at a later time, like at low peak volume um, hours, such as the middle of the night, um, to throw it into a relational database, for example. Um, so, I mean, it's just a, a matter of how you want to implement the technology. Um, but um, if your question is how reliable are WebSockets, um, it'll be dependent on how much data the client can receive um, before the memory runs out. Um, the nice thing is about our example that we saw was that our stats were simply four numbers. Um, so, I mean, that doesn't take up much memory. And our recent cases were filtered out by the top five. So we just got rid of anything else that was a bit older. Um, that way we never have to worry about running out of memory from a huge amount of events. Um, and I'm sure there's certain complex application that you might need to um, address a bit differently, but I think these, they're not necessarily workarounds, but they're solutions to these problems. I hope I answered your question on it. Did it just ramble? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you did. I just, uh, I would, it seems like such a big task to get, you know, all that data into one place. And I guess I'm just unfamiliar with the technologies that would do it, but it might be somewhat tangential to what you were, you know, talking about, which is how to create a seamless connection between, you know, data that is getting updated that frequently in the client. Right. And uh, I mean, these problems aren't easy to solve. Um, any sort of CRUD application with volume will also run into similar issues. Um, 
just a matter of how you sort of architect the application and uh, scale it and its scalability mostly um, and reliability that you really tend to see these problems arise. Um, but in the case that you do have a system that's getting this much data and you need someone to look at it frequently, then um, I guess I'm just trying to demonstrate that WebSockets are the way to go in terms of uh, viewing it more rapidly and uh, without overhead. Cool, any other questions? Comments? Concerns? <laughs> uh, I've got a quick question, uh, and my information is probably a bit out of date, but uh, years ago, I remember there uh, would often be kind of trouble maintaining WebSocket connections over, especially like over load balancers. Have you encountered anything like that? Uh, and so like in the past, uh, even though WebSockets were kind of like practically the, principally the right solution, people would still tend to do a lot of long polling uh, for, for these sorts of use cases. Have you uh, encountered any problems like that? Yeah, so um, unfortunately, I've never been on a project uh, that required WebSockets um, to be used for data transfer. Um, as much as I think it's a great idea, just uh, the opportunity never arose. So I've never had to deal with things like uh, a reverse proxy or firewall, for example, getting into the way. Um, but I would imagine that, um, and I've sort of uh, been following WebSockets for a while. I mean, uh, one of my college classes, I made a checkers game using WebSockets. Um, and you would definitely run into intermittent issues with the connection dropping randomly. Um, I don't know if that was necessarily the technology failing as much as the implementation of the technology not being ready there yet. Um, I think that there are mechanisms in place now that handle the um, sort of reestablishment of that connection in case if it drops or maybe there's a network outage for a second or you know, you're on your phone, you transfer from mobile to um, Wi-Fi um, data. Um, that it can reestablish that connection and pick you off where you left off. It's just a matter of setting up that infrastructure. Yeah, I, I could add something too. So at my last company, I, uh, I architected a, an application where we had a, a real-time map and on that map there were vehicles moving around and all that. So we used WebSockets and I remember when I first set it up, I think I, it was an AWS environment and then I think I had it as a classic load balancer, which doesn't work with WebSockets. So I think I had to change it to more of the application load balancer, and then it started working. So, um, so it, in a way, I think you're quite in your question. You said, "Is that an old thing?" I think yeah. You know, I think that is was a limitation a long time ago, but I don't think it's much anymore. So okay, cool. And then somebody else said here, their last job was a trading app using WebSocket server by Spring app. Just connects weren't really a problem outside the client losing network connectivity. Yep, same thing. And uh, I think a trading app is a great example of this. Yeah. I mean, uh, you can see Robinhood if you guys have experience using that app, but it uh, is amazing how it just is so responsive and it can just update the price of the stock sort of immediately. Um, and I'm not sure if they use WebSockets or if they poll every second, but that's sort of where the inspiration came from is that uh, trading apps, I think, uh, are real time and uh, there's a lot of trades happening during. Yeah. Um, and it's definitely cool that you're using WebSockets to sort of uh, solve these problems. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> I love it. I love the push, you know. There's even a one time uh, I did like a mobile app and I had like a uh, dashboard thing. Um, and even the app, you know, not even using WebSockets, but using uh, push uh, server events. What was that called? Um, or it was just a, like a one way server to client. Even that was awesome at the time. And that was like 2014, you know. Yeah. Um, just, yeah. Well, I think the future should be pushed. I don't think anybody should be pulling for data anymore. I mean, we have uh, web hooks that you can yeah. Yeah. web sockets. Uh. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So I'm saying 2014, that was my first taste of it, even though it wasn't uh, 
bi-directional. It was only server to client push, um, whatever that was called. Uh, it was popular in uh, Ruby and Rails at that time. But, um, but yeah, then WebSockets is the ultimate.